Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website DollarCollapse.com. Welcome back to the show, John. Hey, Jim. President Trump is going to be making his announcement on whether to stay in the agreement that... Uh, stopped Iran for making atomic bombs or did it really anyway i guess we'll find out tomorrow and in the meantime the price of oil has hit the 70 dollar a barrel mark something it hasn't seen for four years yeah and you know part of the oil price increases the the whole middle east thing because besides us uh threatening to pull out of the iran agreement israel is bombing syria um as a way of fighting Iran and threatening Syria if they let Iranian fighters on Syrian land, you know, so so it's turning into this huge mess. Oh, and then uh, Saudi Arabia is in turmoil of its own, and, you know, they're um, kind of sort of fighting with Iran, so um, the Middle East is this huge, oh, and Russia's there. <laughs> you know, we, we are shooting at people who Russia is supporting, and they're shooting at people who we support. So it's this huge mess, and should it boil over, obviously that, that makes oil go up in price dramatically. So oil's rising in anticipation of possible trouble in the Middle East. Um, but a lot of other commodities are way up too. So we're seeing commodity inflation right now, Jim. At the same time, we're seeing wage inflation in the U.S. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but a lot of U.S. companies are complaining they can't find enough workers. Oh yeah, you know, you know, we have a lot of companies who have done away with drug tests. I guess that's the only way they can get people um, to work for them is if uh, if they don't bother testing them for drugs because those people won't pass the drug test. Um, so things are getting tight in a lot of ways. We're seeing wage inflation, commodity inflation. Companies are complaining about their margins being squeezed by higher costs, which means they're going to have to raise prices pretty soon. So, uh, you know, lots of stuff happening on that front. Some of it is geopolitical, as I said, and some of it is just, you know, late cycle stuff. When you run out of resources after the economy's been growing by six or seven or eight years, prices start to go up. So, you know, interesting times and very familiar times. This, this is now starting to look more like your typical last year of um, a, an expansion rather than how it's looked for the last few, where everything was really slow and the labor markets weren't tight in any way and and you know it wasn't like it should be for this part of the cycle well now it kind of is the way it normally is late in the cycle and that uh, that bodes ill for stock prices and interest rates and bond prices and lots of other things so if you're an investor right now where should you be putting your money should you be buying gold right now well you know you should always be buying a little bit of gold at a time but it, it really depends on what happens next in terms of history. For instance, if we're going to have a repeat of the 2008-2009 financial crisis, everything collapsed all at once, including gold and silver. They really tanked, but then they took off when governments stepped in and started bailing everybody out. So you didn't want to be long gold and silver going into the first bad year. And then you wanted to be crazy long gold and silver at the bottom of the first bad year, you know, heading into the second year. Um, if, you know, if that's what's coming, then you, you really don't want to be extremely long gold and silver. Uh, however, if we're heading into something reminiscent of the 1970s, where oil goes up and commodities start getting more expensive and currencies fall, because that's really what increasing commodity prices indicate. You know, the, the value of the currency is going down. You know, it takes more dollars to buy oil or wheat, or copper, or cobalt, or whatever. Um, that kind of a scenario, 
is gray for gold and silver. And it's really not clear which one of those we are heading into now. You know, probably heading into one or the other. Either, a, you know, a, a bear market in equities with a big slowdown in the economy or a ramp up of inflation that is reminiscent of the late 70s. So maybe geopolitics is the, um, you know, the key there. If the Middle East blows up, we're in the 1970s again. If it doesn't and... Um, different sectors start crashing, you know, pensions blow up or um, Latin American debt starts to break down or whatever, then, then we're in 2008 <laughs> and we're going to have a crisis um, that's deflationary instead of inflationary. So I wish I could be more help. But right now we've got kind of a crossroads and it's not clear which fork we, we're in the process of taking. We'll have more with John Rubino right after the break. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason. President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. John, is one of the problems is that they haven't been tracking inflation in real terms. In other words, don't forget several years ago under W, uh, Canada and the U.S. and the European nations decided to remove housing and fuel from the inflation index because they said they were too volatile, although they're your biggest expenses. And so they just made a commodity basket that they based inflation on. But really, hasn't inflation really been around 8 or 9% in real terms? Well, it, it depends on who you're talking to and, yeah, how you calculate inflation. Because I, I think you can make the case that financial assets are part of the cost of living, right? If you're investing, which everybody should be, and stocks go up, that raises your cost of investing. Same thing with bonds if they go up or if housing goes up. And those those three categories have been rocking over the past few years. If you added them back into the consumer price index, you would get a higher number. Uh, one branch of the U.S. Fed um, did that to an extent just lately, and they got an inflation rate of 3% rather than 1.8 or whatever it was at the time. So, you know, you get a... a faster rate of inflation um, if you look at asset prices. And I think, you know, the case is pretty clear that you should. Those are costs of living. Jeez. If you, you know, if you're buying a house and house prices go up, then your cost of that part of your life just went up. Same thing with investment assets. Um, so, yeah, inflation has been going up at a, you know, dramatically faster rate in real terms than in government-calculated terms. And I, I think you could also make the case that if we were calculating inflation honestly, then we'd be a lot more worried about it. You know, people would see 3%, and in some cases 4 or 5%, depending on whether, you know, your life um, involves a lot of college expenses or medical expenses. Um, that would be high enough to spook the financial markets. So we wouldn't have these massive bull markets in equities and bonds and real estate to the extent that we do now if inflation was starting to accelerate the way, you know, it is if you calculate financial assets into it. So the fact that um, that people are kind of waking up to this, I think, you know, they, they see their own personal cost of living going up dramatically faster than the government says. And so uh, people are starting to figure out that maybe they're being lied to. And I, I think that that's healthy because the truth is always healthy. 
And it will also lead people to want real assets rather than financial assets, because real assets tend to do well in times of accelerating inflation. And financial assets are, are kind of a mixed bag. You know, bonds do very badly, or government bonds do extremely badly. Corporate bonds do badly, but not as badly as government bonds. And then junk bonds do, you know, usually better <laughs> than, than those other kinds of bonds in times of inflation. Uh, but interest rates tend to rise in periods of inflation, and that's bad for stocks. And of course, bad for um, bonds that depend on you know relative interest rates. So you, you get a um, a period of financial turmoil when inflation really starts to ramp up, and we we could be heading into that now. So um, whether it's the 1970s or the mid 2000s, mid to late 2000s, either way, volatility is going to be a dominant factor in the financial world out there, just because there's going to be so much uncertainty because of all this stuff that, uh, uh, you know, that, that we can't predict very easily and that could be bad basically no matter how it plays out. You know, there's a lot of stuff out like out there like that now and a lot of sectors ready to blow up. You know, we've, um, pensions have been in the news lately for good reason because a lot of pension funds, at least in the U.S., are wildly underfunded. And there's no way that they can earn the money going forward that they need to get back to reasonable funding levels. And they're going to run out of money. So when one of them does, we'll look around and, and wonder who's next, and we're going to find a long list. <laughs> so that could, you know, be something that, uh, that catalyzes a bear market in financial assets. And then you've got, um, emerging market bonds, um, turning out to be a, a, a really bad idea right now. You know, it, what happened over the last few years is that uh, a lot of um, developing countries borrowed a lot of U.S. dollars on the assumption that the dollar would go down in value. Uh, that way they'd be able to pay back cheaper dollars and spend the expensive dollars that they uh, that they borrow right now, and they would make out on the deal. Well, that, that um, worked for a while, and then the dollar lately has been going back up, and that's starting to blow up emerging market financial systems. Uh, the most recent one is Argentina, that had been kind of a success story for a couple of years. They, um, After defaulting on their debts, they elected a pro-business guy who was going to be pro-growth and invite foreign capital in and everything. And, and, you know, he did that for a little while. And then he just started ramping up government spending and increasing the money supply to cover the government spending. And, you know, basically just did what Latin American countries tend to do periodically. Um, and they also borrowed a lot of dollars. In fact, last year, they sold um, two billion and some dollars worth of 100-year bonds. <laughs> Somebody actually lent money to Argentina for a century at, uh, you know, 7% or something like that, which shows you how desperate pension funds are for yield, you know, that they would lend money to a country that um, has had multiple defaults and hyperinflations and new currency replacing old and, and over the last century. Um, they put a bet that that would not happen again for another century, and all they got was 7% interest each year for it. Well, it blew up on them in short order. You know, one year after that bond issue, Argentina uh, has seen its currency tank, and they've had to raise their interest rates to 40% at the short end in order to um, to staunch the bleeding. And historically, if you have to raise your interest rates to 40%, your problems are not over. <laughs> you know, stuff is going to get worse before it gets better. And so that's where Argentina is right now, and that's where the pension funds are that bought those Argentine bonds. So they thought that having, you know, an asset that pays you 7% a year would allow them to meet their 7% or 7.5% uh, return target that the, the politicians who run the pension plans demand of the pension fund managers because that's the only way to cover the promises that, the politicians have made to public sector unions. Well, now not only are those pension funds not going to make that 7%, but they're going to lose half the money that they put into those bonds. So that positive return they expected is going to turn into a fairly big ding on their capital base. 
depending on how many of those bonds they bought. Uh, and it's not just those bonds. Now, all of a sudden, everybody's looking at emerging market debt and thinking, okay, well, who's next? You know, could it be Brazil? Could it be Ecuador? And who knows? You know, so if you've got those bonds, they're going down in price right now. Um, which means that the crisis might move from the periphery to the core of the global financial system. In other words, something that happens in in Argentina wouldn't normally be, be systemically threatening um, to Wall Street banks. But if what happens in Argentina blows up a bunch of U.S. pension funds, then all of a sudden you've got systemic risk here in the U.S. and in Europe and Japan and the rest of the developed world. So... Um, We'll see. You know, this is the kind of thing that could happen very easily. And it's the kind of thing that eventually does happen. We don't know if this is it or not. But eventually something like this will happen, as leveraged as the world is, uh, where, where something that would normally be inconsequential goes wrong. And it turns out to be consequential this time. You know, it turns out to cause dominoes to fall in the rest of the world. So we'll see. You know, I, I think that uh, it certainly bears watching. And if you've got a public sector pension, you need to be paying attention to how it's run because, you know, they've made promises to you, which in a lot of cases, there's no way they can keep. And you need to factor that into your career planning if you're a teacher or a firefighter or a macabre because you are not nearly as well off as you think you are or as you thought you were back when you trusted the guys running your pension plan. So jump on that. Pay attention. We'll have more with John Rubino right after this. Vatic Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatic's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. John, we're seeing plunging birth rates both in India and China, and they're supposed to be, you know, two of the big economies that are supposed to move the world forward. Is that going to be a problem? Or are, just like we expect in North America, robots going to start doing routine jobs? Uh, this is a fascinating story because economists are kind of, of of two minds about the whole population thing and the automation thing. On the one hand, you know, they look at plunging birth rates in most of the world. Uh, other than uh, the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, birth rates are plunging either down to replacement level or below replacement level in the case of Germany and Japan and Italy and a few other places. In other words, our populations are going to start shrinking pretty soon if we, you know, breed at the current level. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it appears that there, there's not an obvious end in sight to the decline in birth rates. Uh, now, a lot of economists look at this and say, oh, my God, you know, we're not going to have enough workers in 20 years to support all the baby boomers who are retiring. How are we going to pay for all these gold-plated retirement entitlements that we've set up? Um, so the, we need to have more babies. You know, we need to increase our population in order to keep the structure of, of our entitlement states intact. So from their point of view, a declining birth rate is a catastrophe. On the other hand, though, you, you've got economists who are looking at automation and they're saying, ooh, artificial intelligence is going to take over truck driving and taxi driving and bartending and waitressing and on and on and on. You know, there aren't going to be human burger flippers or anything in another 20 years and retail stores are going to be all automated. Where are we going to find jobs for all the people if, if everything's automated? So from their point of view, um, a rising birth rate is a catastrophe, you know, because what are we going to do with all the workers who don't have jobs? Um, so I, I kind of think there's a, you know, there's a synthesis of these two ideas that ends with a really hopeful conclusion. And that is that um, if birth rates keep falling and populations start declining 
at the same time that automation takes over a lot of jobs, that's perfect, right? That that means that um, new mechanical workers or um, artificially intelligent workers are going to come online just as we run out of human workers for a lot of these jobs. And, you know, in a lot of ways, obviously, machines are better than people at repetitive jobs. You know, you, your car is better than your feet, um, and your TV set is better than your ears, you know, if you want to pick up a signal from far away. Uh, and, and that's true of, you know, most other kinds of automation. You know, machines just do it better than people do. So as customers of the industries that are automating, that's good for us, right? And, uh, you know, if we didn't have enough kids to stock those industries with workers, so be it. So it, there, there's a, a happy scenario out there in which these two trends kind of develop together, where automation um, takes over jobs at about the rate that uh, a shortage would otherwise have been built up because the Chinese and Indians and Americans and Germans and Japanese and Italians aren't having enough babies. And it all works out. You know, the human population peaks in another 50 or so years and then starts to decline um, at 1% or 2% a year over the following century or so. So that we end up with, um, you know, a stable population of a couple of billion and a world that's way healthier because we're not overburdening it. So I, I, I think that after the gigantic financial crisis is coming, um, we will look around and see a lot of big trends um, inflecting in the right direction. The and European the world... Union, I was going to say, the European Union has already suggested that they tax robots to replace the government revenue lost by income taxes with fewer workers, and then use that money to support the people who were displaced by the robots. Do you see that happening? Well, um, if people are displaced by robots, yeah, we kind of have to do I mean, we already have a social safety net. So if you lose your job because um, your, you know, your bartending gig is automated, um, you can go on unemployment, you can get welfare and stuff like that. And in Europe, that's very generous. So it, it, it's not clear that that's um, this huge burden um, beyond what they already have imposed on themselves. But um, if there just aren't that many new workers in the pipeline as automation happens, then, you know, it's no big deal. Nobody's displaced, really, or, or relatively few people are displaced um, as automation moves up the food chain. So I, I think there's a pretty good chance that these two trends um, continue at more or less the same pace. And when we would have had a shortage of workers, those jobs are taken by robots. You know, that's kind of what Japan's doing right now. They're not, um, they're not inviting a lot of immigrants in to make up for the fact that their birth rate is below replacement rate. They're allowing their population to shrink, and they're replacing the, the workers who aren't there anymore with robots, and they're doing it consciously. So Japan, in a way, is kind of leading the, um, the they're at the leading edge of this trend. And unfortunately, they're having to borrow huge amounts of money to make the transition. So I still think they have a gigantic financial crisis on their hands, um, one in which they're going to have to devalue their currency really dramatically. But they're they're not suffering from labor shortages even though their birth rates are really low because they're automating so much stuff. So, you know, I, it, it's unusual in life for things to work out just right, but this has the, the feel of a trend that that is not going to be nearly as bad on either side. You know, we're not going to have nearly the shortage of laborers or workers that we're afraid we're going to have. Um, and we... we automation isn't going to throw as many people out of work as we're afraid it's going to. Well, in the U.S., you know, a lot of employers are already complaining about a labor shortage with unemployment in the U.S. below 4% for the first time in decades. But don't forget, these were the same companies that laid off people in their 50s because they thought they weren't necessary anymore, and now you're short of workers. Well, guess why? Yeah, yeah. Um we we still got a lot of people in the work or who are not in the workforce, but who are of working age. So the U.S. has this reserve of people <laughs> that nobody knows what they're doing. Really, you know, they're they're not looking for a job, 
they're not working, but they're, you know, 47 years old or whatever. And, and a lot of them could be pulled back into the workforce by higher wages. So to the extent that we start to have some wage inflation now, and uh, and you can make more and more money doing today's jobs, uh, I think we'll find that more and more people will take those jobs eventually. Uh, and I can also and, see a future market for, you say, robots are going to take over, you know, uh, serving jobs. But people will like having humans serve them and, and help them out. So you will be willing to pay a premium for that. Yes. High-end restaurants will continue to have humans while McDonald's and places like that will automate. You know, you'll have a, a human chef <laughs> making your dinner at a high-end restaurant and a, a really presentable human person bringing your your dinner, okay? But at McDonald's, you'll go in and there'll be a touch screen and you'll you'll press a few buttons and then in the back, a robot will make your burger and fries and, and uh, it'll come out on a conveyor belt or something like that. So that's how it'll start. Well, in Vancouver, it's already started. Uh, McDonald's does have touch screens to order your stuff and you can custom build your burger a person brings it to you. But as you said, a conveyor belt might do that in the future. Sure. Yeah, yeah. you know, all, all of this, um, this really basic repetitive stuff is completely automatable. You know, you can uh, you can run a, a Macy's or something like that with way fewer people than, than they have now just because so much of what goes on is, you know, it's cookbook. It's it's an um, algorithm where you do this, then you do this, do, then you do this, and then the task is complete. And you can uh, you can teach a machine to do that. Uh, and machines don't get tired. They, they don't get sick. They don't unionize. You know, they can work 24-7 with a little bit of maintenance at the end of the month. And, and so companies in a lot of cases, find that once they are able to automate a job, that it goes better than with people. <laughs> so I think, that, you know, this is a trend that, that's got legs and is going to accelerate because, um, you know, in the past we've automated physical stuff and then we automated transactional stuff, which is really easy to break down into into coherent steps with an endpoint that's predictable. Uh, now we're starting to automate things that involve judgment. Um, and, and artificial intelligence can do a lot of this. And, then, you know, it's just at the beginning of the process of, of machines getting smarter. So we'll see an exponential increase in the capabilities of um, robots and algorithms and et cetera, et cetera, kinds of machines that can, um, that can start doing things that we used to think were totally the province of human beings. You know, uh, IBM's Watson supercomputer is one of the best diagnosticians in the world. It can do medical diagnostics better than most doctors. Um, most of stock trading now is done by machines. And, you know, stock trading takes thought. <laughs> and it's not something that, uh, that, that you can really um, cook down to a very simple algorithm. It takes judgment. And it, it requires what we used to think of as experience and intuition, et cetera, et cetera. You know, machines do that now. They do the vast majority of the trading on uh, on U.S. exchanges. And it goes on and on. You know, air traffic control is automated, something that used to involve a lot of human judgment is involving less and less and, and more and more machine learning. Um, and this just goes on. So jobs that um, that used to seem immune from automation will not be immune from automation in a a few years or a decade. Uh, and at that point, we need fewer workers. <laughs> so low birth rates. Um, let's say 20 years from now, you know, most legal work is automated. Uh, a big chunk of medicine is automated. Um, most service industries are automated. Well, maybe we need 40% fewer people in the uh, the working age population at that point to produce the same amount of stuff. And to the extent that birth rates are plunging right now, that solves part of that problem. And, you know, the, the idea that um, we would be a less happy country if, in the U.S. if we had 100 million people instead of three or 400 million like now, I think is a, a total myth. We would, we would be a way nicer place to live. The U.S. would be a nicer place to live with fewer people. You know, we're grossly overcrowded now, and we're not even the most crowded country. You know, most, uh, most other um, major countries 
have population densities that are vastly higher than the U.S. does. So I, I think lifestyles would improve dramatically if we had more land per person in the future than we do now. I, for one, welcome our robot overlords. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John? you know, that's the downside of it, though, Jim. Yeah. Uh, what happens if they don't need us anymore or yeah. decide they don't like us, you know? Because uh, at, at some point, the whole Terminator scenario becomes not not probable or anything, but conceivable, you know, because we're, we're going to have so much of uh, daily life in the hands of things that don't necessarily even have hands, but uh, but are figuring it out at a level that uh, that is beyond us. You know, we won't be able to understand how most of life happens. Uh, we might enjoy a lot of it, but we won't know how it's done. You know, and we that's may what be we're kept kind of as pets. Mercy. We may be kept as pets. <laughs> yeah, you know that. Okay, the, the whole dark side of AI is is a whole show for us sometimes. Yeah, it is because <laughs> it is scary, and and it's completely feasible going forward that uh, that some algorithm out there. Um, that has, you know, self-learning capabilities just takes off. And, and you may then, not realize it because they're so smart until yeah. it's too late. Yeah, who knows? There's a great book called After On that I, I listened to the audio version of it a while ago, and it gets this. You know, the, the author of this thing gets how Silicon Valley plays into AI and what might happen when, when a machine becomes self-aware. Fascinating book. And it had a happy ending. So, oh, good. You know, hold that thought. Okay, John, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Jim. My guest has been John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, dollarcollapse.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show or our guests can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.